The year is 1904. The construction of the Panama Canal begins. You must do it. A podcast. Year by year, event by event. I defeat it is the only way to save humanity. I am the angel of time. Hello, Johnny. Hello, Phil. Back again. Yeah, and welcome listeners to the podcast where we return to the 20th century at the behest of a time angel and travel year by year, event by event, in chronological order, and we have to bring back an item each at the end. Would you say that's that about covers it, Johnny? That's pretty much the gist of it, yeah. Right. to Panama today. Well, we better get on with it. Pile in. Time travels. So we're in 1904 (coughs) in Panama, construction of the Panama Canal, where a massive engineering work is undertaken to create a water passage between two oceans, the Atlantic and Pacific. That sounds like a difficult job. How the hell did they do it? (laughs) How did they do it? I'm glad you asked, I'm glad you asked. It actually started with the French in the 1880s. But the dream had been alive a lot longer because if you think about it, uh, shipping was like so vital for like getting items around the globe. But it took such a long time to get from Atlantic Ocean to Pacific Ocean because you had to sail all the way around South America. Ooh. And sounds quite dangerous to me. Yeah, is dangerous. that the Cape of Good Hope? No, I think no. that's actually in Africa. Uh, <laughs> sorry. But map makers for many years have been looking at the uh, at the Central America and thinking, oh, that's just so annoying. Yeah. Like, there's this little strip of land in Central America. You know, it's not very wide. The very small strip of land uh, dividing the two oceans. King Charles I of Spain, he was the first one to think, hold on, this could really serve our colonial interests if we can somehow get across this little isthmus. Um, but obviously back then... Um, what did you say? Isthmus? Isthmus. That's the name of this geographical... Um... Uh, for the benefit of the listener, um, we're actually watching a 10-hour-long video of a full transit down the Panama Canal. So we're just watching um, the beautiful, sort of misty uh, jungle vibe. It's nice. It looks serene, but imagine having to dig that out. We'll come to that in a minute, oh, how yeah. much hard work this must have been. Panama is between... Uh, 37 and 110 miles wide. So let's assume that they built the Panama Canal at the narrowest point. So I would say yeah, probably about like 37, 40 miles between that of how much they had to dig out the cap- out the actual rock and gouge it from the earth to make this canal. Um, and but yeah, up- it was impossible to do up until the 1880s when France had a bash at it. Yeah. Uh, under a guy called uh, Ferdinand de Lesseps so, in 1881. Before you, French move on, company. Uh, before you move on with our Ferdinand, one of the biggest losses, losses of life in terms of construction projects, man-made, man-made disasters, and I don't think the British are directly involved. Oh, that's good. So they, they've got no, no blood on their hands here. I don't think so. Well, our, <laughs> our French friends, they certainly do have a lot of blood yes. on their hands. Oh, it turned out so it wasn't just the British who had an evil world spanning empire after all. Who knew? Who knew? Yeah, so, so Ferdinand de Lesseps, he was a former diplomat who had canal building experience because he'd helped develop uh, the other famous canal in the world at this point. The you Norfolk know Broads. The Norfolk Broads. <laughs> no, no, think again. Uh, was it the Suez Canal? Yes, indeed, the Suez Canal in Egypt. However, the Panama one was a lot more difficult and uh, it encountered just problem after problem. Can you think why it was so difficult, this digging in Panama, as opposed to digging in Egypt? We've got the benefit here of looking at the canal and it looks, for a start, massive and in very inhospitable conditions across through jungle, probably. You can still see the jungle mists even now as the waves lick and... Oh, no, they're not waves, are they? No, they're waves. How do you get waves in a canal? I suppose they're 
It's just water from yeah, the wind, perhaps blowing across <laughs> the, weather, the water. The ships all going, creating the wake of the ships. I mean, you're essentially right about the jungle. That was what caused so much problem, because it was a completely different condition to like the dry, deserty um, environment of Egypt, where the Suez Canal was built. Here, you had tropical diseases, and it's really humid, really hot. Um, you there can are... see it. You can see how humid it is. Look at that. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like literally Central American jungle, lush, verdant forests that you have to cut down. While you're cutting it down, all sorts of creepy crawlies are like Ooh. crawling out. Snakes are trying to bite you. Uh, you've got a rainy season, or almost like it's always rainy season, I think, in Central it, America. It, it, it so looks bit... uh, very close. Mm, very close, very muggy. Muggy, yeah. And you've got mudslides that are burying workers alive. Earthquakes. Uh, there was an f- earthquake that hit the country uh, sometime in the 1880s and it uh, caused a fire in the city of Colon. Uh, it was completely destroyed by a fire. When did construction start? Again, 1880s? 1880s, yeah. 1881, the French actually started really like digging in and having a bash. Good old. Like digging out the first cut, they called it. Um, Do you know what they used? I think they used heavy machinery. And a lot of labour, like cheap labour. Not not slavery, but effectively slaves. They, they ship people from the French colonies uh, to work for very low wages and in very poor conditions. Tropical diseases. Oh, yeah. And to battle with that on top of the incredibly back-breaking work. Quick idiots. History is starting to unravel. I've got a quote from a labourer called Alfred and he says, the working condition in those days, they were so horrible it would stagger your imagination. Death was our constant companion. I shall never forget the trainloads of dead men being carted away daily, as if they were just so much lumber. Blimey. A disaster. Uh, I mean, um, I, I've, the, you, you've probably um, seen the sort of the, t- the top ten, the top of the pops of them. Um, History's greatest man-made disasters. I haven't actually, but I assume that Panama Canal is up there. It was a bloody, bloody business to build this thing. Particularly on the French side. We'll come to the American side in a bit and why they succeeded where the French didn't. Because am I right in saying the Americans don't take over until, like, 1914? Or do they take it over? Oh, no, they take it over much earlier because we're looking at 1904 as our year. They Uh... take it over in... 1904. 1904. That's when the Americans took it over. Yeah, yeah. Why do I think it's 1914? It was finished ten years later. They reckon around 20,000 people died in the French attempt before they abandoned it in 1888. So from 1881 to 1888, uh, accidents and more so disease claimed the lives of around about 20,000 labourers. Uh, Most of these dead were hailing from the Caribbean islands, like Antigua, Barbados, Jamaica. Malaria is a real problem, yellow fever. Um, So an estimated three quarters of the French engineers who joined Ferdinand de Lesseps, they'd actually died within three months of arriving just because they were completely unused to this tropical climate. And they wouldn't have intended to have killed off all the engineers, probably, would they? No, no. So <laughs> losing your engineers, that's a problem in itself. That's, I'm sure, why work didn't go quite as planned, because they kept having to replace these, uh, the more highly trained engineers. The people digging in the ground, they were very disposable to the French, but it was much harder to replace these engineers. So this is all the deadliest construction projects in human history. Death rate per 1,000 workers. So Panama Canal... Um, is right up the top. I'm just going to bring that up now. There you go. 408 deaths per thousand. Burma Siam Siam Railway coming in a close second. Um, Suez, a few down there at 80 deaths per 1,000 workers. Which is still quite a lot, remember, but Panama Canal is special in it, being literally, what? what's that, like half, 50% survival rate? That's like the survival rate of Ebola. Then there are some interesting newer examples, of course. You might spot there towards the bottom the Qatar Qatar World Cup, which must be the only disaster on here, I think, from or a construction, deadly construction project from the last like 
50 years mm. at least. Yeah, they certainly got some blood on their hands. Should be doing better, Qatar. Yeah, they're nowhere near Panama, but they are nestling there between the Gothard Base Tunnel and the Titanic. Um, I assume it means the construction of the Titanic and doesn't include the sinking. The history repeats itself. Repeats itself. The history repeats itself. Repeats itself. The history of history repeats itself. Repeats itself. First as a tragedy, then as a farce. Repeats itself. One, one labourer I've got repeats called Antonio itself. Sanchez, he said that work in the cut was like going to a battlefield. So these statistics do actually show that, yeah, it was actually going... 50%. ...to war with the, with the canal, if, if you are losing so many people. They really suffered gruesome injuries as well, like quite often requiring amputation. And in fact, so many Panama Canal workers were maimed during the construction, but you had the artificial limb makers of the time all clamouring and competing for these highly coveted government contracts to supply artificial limbs Bloody to hell. the workers. A uh, Canadian doctor who was working with the French, he estimated that between 30 and 40 workers a day were dying during the wet seasons. Uh, they didn't have their disease control down. Uh, I've got another quote from an engineer, Adolphe de Gaudin. He says, There is too much water. The rocks are exceedingly hard. The soil is very hilly and the climate is deadly. The country is literally poisoned. Oh, God. And they, they, they gave up, basically. By 1888, they'd sunk a ridiculous amount of money in. Let me, let me see how much they'd sunk in. I think they, they put in $260 million dollars. Uh, for an excavation of more than 70 million cubic yards of earth. So they had done something, but the cost at which it came was just too much. And in the end, it was, it was shut down by the, by the French company that was backing it. They said, no, enough is enough. <laughs> we take a bit enough more than we can chew. And uh, yeah, there was a big scandal because the French had put so much money in. Uh, it caused a uh, like a lot of angry investors in France. I bet. Yeah, so De La Seps and his son Charles, uh, along with actually the guy who built the Eiffel Tower, Mr Eiffel, he was involved in this construction oh. project. Uh, so Mr Eiffel, Le Seps, his son, and a few other executives, they were indicted on fraud and mismanagement. Post-Panama? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't have a good they, they, that A few were sentenced to prison asleep. and fined, although eventually their, sentence were, with, their sentences were overturned, but... Uh, Mr. Eiffel, he said, right, enough is enough, I'm retiring from business. Uh, he pointed towards his Eiffel Tower as his grand achievement, but not many people remember that he failed big time in his uh, venture in the Panama Canal, Mr. Eiffel. Yeah, very lucky Eiffel. There. It was uh, a... That's, that's not going to work. What? So it's gonna be, it was an Eiffel adventure. <laughs> I was going to say someone had an Eiffel of something. Anyway, yeah, Ferdinand de la Sepps, he never even, um, he never saw the Panama Canal completed because he died in 1894. The foundations of this cut through Panama have been laid. Uh, and it's here that America starts to take a little bit of interest because they are now the new up-and-coming power, imperial power in the world. The old em empires are fading at this point in early 20th century. America is beginning to flex its imperial muscles. And they think, ah, hold on, actually, all this work the French have done, that could be mighty useful to us. Yeah. Uh, because there was a Spanish-American war. When? Mm, with that, that was, um, what, 1890? I think 1890, so I'm, I'm putting you on the spot now. Eight, uh, I, I think, yeah, turn of the century. I said 1890. There was a Spanish-American war. 1898. Oh, what was that about? South America? Uh, I think it was mainly around Cuba. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, Americans wanted to, you know, have their backyard, and Cuba was part of it. Anyway, Spanish-Americans fought, uh, and it took the battleship Oregon 68 days to get from Cuba uh, to the other side of America, I guess. So it was sailing all the way around. But the, yeah. they realised the canal could have shortened that to 20 days. So it was in its military strategic interest to develop this canal. Yeah, uh, the French of course, Mr. The Mr. Money President and Roosevelt, he began thinking now. Uh, and uh, the Panama Isthmus was actually a province of Colombia at this point. So it wasn't independent. But there was a nascent independent movement brewing and 
rebels in the hills, and the US was very sneaky doing its uh, standard practice, or what would become standard practice, of fermenting a revolution yeah. in Panama, because uh, they tried to buy a strip of the, the strip of land off Colombia, but they didn't offer enough money, and Colombia said, "No, get lost. That's a pittance." Yeah. Uh, so the Americans weren't going to be dissuaded. Rather, they thought, "Well, you're not going to accept our lowball offer. Fine, we'll just ferment this revolution." And a uh, little bit help with the French as well, who were also still like quite colonial, messing around as well. Yeah. Uh, that they. So they're all sort of building up to First World War as well, mm, right? Empire, yeah. Empire willy waving. Exactly. Stuff. Exactly. So, with a little bit of help from the French, the Panama Revolt occurs in uh, November 1903, and uh, Colombia can't do anything about it because you know they're not exactly a superpower and. It's because of the geographical position, it's really hard for Colombia to get troops up through this isthmus, in this very narrow gap. And, and it's, it's an isthmus, I was going to ask, a, a specific technical term for like the, that point, or is yes. it the... Ta- okay. Yes. yes. Much that once was is lost. We are time tripping. For I can see what is to come. We, we are time tripping high. Much that once was is lost. Go back, go back, learn the lessons. It is the only way to avoid catastrophe. John said so Colombia can never send its forces in, uh, and Panama gains independence, but very much under US support. Uh, so the US on November the 6th, three days after this revolt breaks out, they recognise Panama. Naughties. And yeah, it's at this point that Theodore Roosevelt, he can begin overseeing his dream. It was one of his uh, uh, like statement projects to build this canal. So he's now overseeing uh, like the setting up of the transfer of the Panama Canal from a French interest into an American interest. Look at it. We're par- currently on the Panama Canal passing a large sort of um, jungly mountain hill, would you call it, Johnny? Mm. Yeah, it's quite hilly, isn't it? It's not just flat country, but full of these hills and jungle trees. Yeah, it's proper like depths of the rainforest. If anyone has a spare 10 hours listening, I would recommend this YouTube video. What's it called? Panama Canal Full Transit Brackets, not time lapse. 10 hours, 46 minutes. It's a relaxing thing to have on the background. You feel like you are yeah. journeying down it without the horrible humidity and mosquitoes. And Although you can almost feel that coming through the screen. Mm, there's like a heat haze, isn't there, yeah. coming off the water and from the jungle particularly. Like if you look into the jungle, you really don't want to go trekking through there. It's not like a relaxing hike. No, you could cut that air with a knife. So anyway, 1903, uh, end of 1903, America's signing a treaty and it gets to lease a 10 mile wide strip of land for the canal either side uh, for a one time payment of $10 million to Panama and then an annual annuity of $250,000. And it also agrees to guarantee the independence of Panama. So Panama now has a protector Uh in America. So we can really see... America, as I was saying, flexing its imperial muscles. Which and then destabilises Colombia and everywhere else. Mm, right. yeah, Have you yeah. read um, Marquez, 100 Years of Gabriel Solitude? Gabriel Garcia Marquez, yeah, great. yeah, really like that one. Brilliant, isn't it? All the Latin American countries at this point were trying to form their own nation states and they didn't really have time to like keep America in check. He was like sneakily wheedling its way, particularly into Central America. Yeah, yeah. And messing around there. Bloody naughty. Um, and just before you carry on, Johnny, I'd just like to say that uh, the, the weather's clearing up on the Panama Canal. Uh, there's some blue in the sky. There's a little little breeze there we can see with that little flag waving. Mm-hmm. Conditions are clement, so let's sail on. It's a lo- lovely day for a cruise down the Panama Canal. There was Oops. a chap called Gorgas in, uh, in the, on the US team. And he was actually a yellow fever survivor himself, realised that yellow fever wasn't caused by 
uh, filth and rotting garbage and miasmas, all these airborne diseases, like this medieval belief that it was uh, yeah, just uh, all the rotting stuff that's lying around, or the bad airs. Yeah, uh, it was rather mosquitoes that. that were causing yellow fever. Uh, mosquitoes were also causing the malaria, which was even more rampant. And so they basically went on a massive campaign along their 10-mile strip that they owned to exterminate as many mosquitoes as they possibly could. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there were whole teams just devoted to this one job of mosquito eradication. <laughs> Do you have a favourite method for eradicating a mosquito when you hear that? Little... Well, my initial thought is that they're, just, they're so invasive that there almost isn't a, probably isn't a very good method. Especially not in the, those days. No, no. I mean, I just use the clap of the hand when I see one. Yeah, but you that's can't very go much around last. Panama clapping your hand <laughs> no. to exterminate every mosquito. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. There'd be a lot of thigh slapping and arm slapping. How do we eradicate mosquitoes? The first one was drainage. They drained all of the water from around where they're working. Uh, then they no, cut not. the brush and grass. They like cleared the area around it so the mosquitoes wouldn't have anywhere to hide. Then they began oiling the <laughs> edges of the swamps and ponds so that you could kill the mosquito larvae with the oil. They had people with these big backpacks of chemicals and like larvicides spraying. There's some great pictures of a guy with this big backpack of chemicals uh, with a spray going around. Like whatever mosquitoes might be considered to congregate, he's blasting them off. Probably a very toxic job as well to do uh, so. Um, then they gave out uh, quinine to the workers. Just they, the tonic that <laughs> yeah indeed <laughs> uh, they did screening and yeah if they saw an adult mosquito screaming at it's not screaming no they didn't just yell <laughs> shouting <laughs> abuse at the mosquito it's amazing they'd actually more or less uh, eradicated cases of yellow fever particularly by the end of 1905 oh right their malaria work was like first class top notch and sort of served as a model for future handling of malarial outbreaks and uh, mm. like how to Carl mosquito populations basically. A big development in healthcare here because uh, the sanitary inspector, a certain Joseph Le Prince, he estimated that in 1906 about 80% of the workforce had at some point been hospitalised for malaria, but their treatment was just better and you know they could help them bounce back a little bit quicker. What do you think the actual work was like? If someone said, Phil, you are now a labourer on the Panama Canal, you've been press-ganged into this. Mm -mm. What do you think your typical day would be? I... Okay, so I'm not, I was about to say, I would have to just try and escape or, and, or die trying. Like, I'd rather die. The type of weather it is, muggy, swampy, makes me feel really bad, sick. Just staring at it now. The Panama Canal. Yeah, I mean, there would have been different jobs, probably at the most basic job. They'd have given you a shovel or a pickaxe and just said, like, yeah, start digging. Um, but the majority of it was done with heavy machinery. How big was it? The canal or the machinery? The machinery in cubic cubes. <laughs> <laughs> it was sizable. You've got these things called uh, steam shovels, which are basically uh, like a train carriage by the looks of things. And they... Uh, they get there by rail, and then just sort of excavate, pulling Sorry. massive amounts of earth out. So I suppose at the same time as this, roughly, you're getting a lot of, like, expansion of um, colonial powers across the world for these massive, back-breaking projects. Mm -hmm. Like in Bermuda, I think, with the British. Maybe that's a bit earlier. Um, anyway, yeah. So here keep, I've got keep a me on. picture I can show you for the benefit of our listeners. It's like, uh, if you imagine... A, like western mine where you've got the little mine cart and you, it's on rails and you load it up with earth and then it gets uh, wheeled off so yeah someone's got to fill up oh these God. wheelbarrows and mine carts for want of a better word with soil with rubble here you've got a, a steam shovel which is like a, yeah, a train thing with but not as big as on. I was expecting it's not um, like the cross rail uh, thing that... No, they haven't quite got crossrail <laughs> tech yet. It's very much a manual process. 
But then oh, once you've cleared God. the cut, then you have to build all this concrete and the walls of the dam. So this is, again, like really hard well, work. It, it looks like pyramid scale. But, and is, I think it is it the is, biggest. I would say pyramid scale venture, just with better tech and, and it, less isn't slavery. It, isn't it seen as the biggest thing since the pyramids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the most ambitious construction project the world has seen today. It kind of was really. slavery, though, on it, basically. And do they, are they sure that slaves built the pyramids? They're always coming up with new crazy theories. Like aliens. Aliens. Without, without opening that pan of worms. Out. Aliens did not build the Panama Canal. We have photographed the truth. <laughs> and this is an incredibly elaborate hoax. That aliens did not build Panama Canal. That's uh, why I like history that, blood. Uh, history that there are photos of best. Mm -hmm. Here's a steam shovel for you. Oh, God. I can describe it a bit better now. It's... Yeah, a railway carriage with a great big, uh, like, claw thing on the front. Yeah, it's like... And it would grab at the earth, gouge at the earth, lift it up, and then swing it around and dump it somewhere. It, and then people would shovel that into wheelbarrows. It, it looks like your sort of your Nana's uh, afternoon tea steam train that you get from Victoria through the country with a giant steampunk... Um, pulley system and horse's head and thing on the front that gets rid of earth. You can see it's just uh, spewing out smoke as well. It's probably incredibly noisy and also dangerous. Give... I, I think we underestimate how dangerous these machines are just by looking at the pictures, but they were always going wrong, <laughs> yeah. breaking. Some I don't know if I would underestimate the it. danger of that. It looks absolutely terrifying. This next picture we have Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, interestingly enough, he was the first president, US president, to take a trip outside of the country while he was serving. The principles for which we stand are the principles of fair play and a square deal. But, yeah, he visited Pan Panama Canal to oversee his pet project. You can see him here having fun. He's in his little Panama hat, his nice white suit, oh, sitting, yes. on, sitting on this steam shovel, looking very pleased. I've got a bit about the Panama hat, because looking at our video along the canal, I saw some people wearing Panama hats. Oh, Panama hats. Tell me they come from Panama. Well, they originated in during the construction of the Panama Canal in their current known form as Panama hats. They were originally from Ecuador, though, actually. Um, but it was workers wearing them during construction to protect their heads from the sun. Um, and then they, they became Panama hats. And the reason I brought it up is because President Roosevelt, uh, we just saw in that picture, um, started wearing them um, and associating them with his grand project. I don't have a Panama hat. They look quite snazzy, though. I might start wearing one in the summer. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll share that nugget, not actually from Panama. You no, know, they were called Ecuadorian hats, but now they're Panama hats since since Roosevelt popped one on when he was overseeing the canal and became probably a very American thing. Does Hannibal Lecter wear one at the end when he's wandering mm. off? Yeah. yeah. In fact, Roosevelt's wearing in this picture a quite a similar outfit to Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. The white suit. <laughs> exactly, the linen suit, right? Mm. Amazing. I'm sure we must have, or our friends at school must have worn a Panama hat at some point. It uh, sounds about right. Our hat wearing Dubious days. fashion statements of youth. A yes. Panama hat on a Fez. teenager. Yeah. Bless us. The engineers and the administrators on the, of the Panama Canal dressed up in their white linen suits, their Panama hats, yeah. looking out and... The actual backbreaking work is being done by yeah, black West Indian labour, and they're, you know, dying in their thousands. It's horrendous. It's like a giant grave site. So essentially, you had a stratified workforce to build the canal. You had high-level engineering jobs, clerical position, skilled labour. They were reserved for Americans, but manual labour was all immigrants, basically. Uh, initially, they were filled by Europeans from Spain, Italy, and Greece. But the Americans quickly realised that these were sort of unreliable and a bit radical and militant due to their political beliefs and general turmoil at this time. And just so sort they, of more experience of fight, fighting for their own workers' mm, rights. Yeah, exactly. So. They were getting unionised and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. wanted better conditions. So these were gradually phased out and replaced by recruitment from the uh, French and British West Indies. There was a horrible place uh, nicknamed Hell's Gorge, uh, or the Culebra Cut, and 
this was the toughest part of the rock. The Devil's Gorge. Uh, Hell's Gorge. Hell's Gorge. May as well be the Devil's Gorge, though. Big kill, Devil yeah, Hell. It's just like a cauldron of noise and roaring locomotive, belching steam. Yeah, you've got so much risk involved. You're saying, like, you're waking up on your day, like, oh, no, I'm <laughs> Kel's Gorge today, the worst. <laughs> you've got many ways to die or be maimed, from, like, these massive machines crunching earth, um, drowning, yellow fever, malaria. There are so many ways that your day can quickly turn nasty when building the Panama Canal. Horrific. There was one point where uh, the workers in this Culebra Cut, they were blasting away at the mountains with the dynamite. And uh, sometimes it would ignite prematurely, or like the excavating machines might hit a hidden bit of dynamite. And these these workers, they didn't really have much downtime either to begin with. They had Until they... very minimal facilities for entertainment and relaxation. Because you are literally in the jungle. It's like, okay, I've finished work, what do I do now? Uh, and as a result, alcohol abuse was a great problem. Like, after they'd finished their day, what do you do? Yeah. Bloody right. Yeah, knock back with a cold one. But God, not, not a cold one, like cheap moonshine, I guess. It's not the weather for knocking all the cheap no, moonshine. No, no, and we were saying, like, imagine waking up with uh, <laughs> malaria and having to go to work. But just imagine waking up with a hangover a from, moonshine hangover. from your session the night before on this dodgy Pan- Panamanian moonshine. Right, because I'm looking at the screen of the canal visit and it's making me feel actually sick thinking of that hangover. I've had, you know... Summer weddings where I've had too many beers and it's been terrible. Imagine the... Oh. <laughs> oh. Here's your shovel, Phil. Rise and shine. Six o'clock in the morning. Time to go to Hell's Gorge. No, I'm hiding in that um, stupid Hogwarts Express train with the big claw on the end. I'm going to hide in the, one of the carriages. <laughs> but you know what? Things did get better, actually. Uh, yeah? After a while, they started realising that you can't just work people to the bone. Uh and let them get drunk each night. So they, they began building clubhouses, managed by the YMCA. Oh, yep, yep. Uh, you could play pool. You yeah, had reading rooms, bowling alleys even. Great. Uh, dark rooms for camera clubs. Uh, ice cream parlours, soda fountains, a circulating library. That's the what? Circul- okay, so it goes around. Mm-hmm. I imagined it like a big revolving library. Americans love baseball, so they built some baseball fields. Yeah, I wouldn't... T- I wouldn't have much shock for that. Were there um, theatrical shows, like in thing, in eight hour thought, Mum? There were semi-monthly Saturday night dances. Spacious ballroom at the uh, Hotel Tivoli. Mm. I wouldn't have done well in that era. So, you know we mentioned quinine. Quinine? Quinine? Earlier? Just the tonic. As, uh, yeah, a tonic to ward off malaria. Do you know what the unfortunate side effect of quinine is? Quinine consumption um, makes you shit. <laughs> Possibly that could be one, but the one I'm looking for is it makes you go a little bit deaf. Uh, yeah, the, the the workers had this inability that meant to hear uh, as well as they should, and so when mm. someone shouted, "Fire in the hole!" someone just like, blissfully unaware, then boom. The dynamite goes off, and yeah, some people didn't get out in time because they're half deaf through oh god through all this quinine, and obviously all the roaring machinery around and everything. Butterfly effect. Mm-hmm. I think I'm allergic to quinine, quinine, quinine. Um, it's worth pointing out, isn't it? So between 1904 and the end of construction in 1913, the US had recorded the deaths of 5,855 canal workers. So one of the main reasons that the Panama Canal was so successful under the Americans was the chief engineer and project leader, George Gotals, uh, from the US Army Corps of Engineers. And under his tenure, he actually was identifying all the risks and planning very carefully. He was a very organised man. Yeah, that would have helped, wouldn't it? He definitely the, needed the an organiser here. Not, not just a dreamer, he needed a practical man <coughs> from the US Army Corps of Engineers. And he was the one that started putting in place all these uh, all these programmes to prevent the de- d- diseases. He's investing in the insect control and the public health measures. He's investing in worker um, compensation schemes and just to. generally trying to make the workers' lives a little bit better. 
So making sure they're well fed for one, well housed, well equipped, and also some of these entertainment things that we touched on. He was quite keen on his workers uh, not just working, but also being able to relax a little bit in their downtime. Uh, he rewarded his employees with like medals and some other schemes to boost productivity and morale. Lovely. Yeah, it'd be nice to get a medal, wouldn't it, yeah. for your work? Shows that you're appreciated. Basically bringing a little bit of HR into mm. into the chaos. Indeed. He was a bit of an HR man, because uh, George... Well, think of what HR stands for. You're like, oh, yeah. Human resources. Oh, God, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, this is literal human resources. Human remains. But yeah, George Gertles, he, he had his HR programme every morning... He would allow people to come to him and air their disputes and their grievances, and he would sit on his chair, sort of like King Solomon, making judgments on the various grievances. And, uh, oh, sorry to interrupt, Johnny. We've got a very fast little tugboat coming past us on the canal. Yeah, that's where your waves are You can see the wake kicking out the waves. Do you think they've got crocodiles in it? I'm sure they've got all sorts of nasties in there, in the actual water. Crocodiles, piranhas, snakes. Things that you just don't want to do. Puts things in perspective. Um, Johnny, what did you bring back from the Panama Canal? So, I was really impressed with a backpack that holds a larvicide mixture of carbolic acid, resin, and caustic soda. And you can spray it on mosquitoes, and you basically wipe out the eggs of mosquitoes. So I'm thinking for the garden, that would be quite a good tool. Bloody hell, you wouldn't get that through customs, would you? <sighs> what about you, Phil? What did you pull well, in from the Panama Canal? A simpler item, just this handwritten note. It just says, a man, a plan, a canal, Panama. Taco cat. I've memorised it now. See you next time. Bye bye. Imperial euphoria, death of Queen Victoria.